Chapter 11 of Call of the Bully is called Midnight Madness. I clapped my hands twice. More grapes. Tabitha walked over to me, bringing the green fruit. I plucked one. Then I turned to look at Jessica. She was fanning me with a large palm leaf. The breeze blew gently through my hair, and I leaned back to my throne, feeling completely relaxed and happy. Someone tapped me on the head. I sighed. Girls, girls, no more grapes now. The prince needs his beauty rest. Ah, uh, uh, it, it's time to go, Rodney. Everyone's asleep. Huh? My eyes opened into darkness. I became aware that Fernanda was leaning over me. You're dreaming about grapes? No, it was only a dream. I wanted to roll over and cry into my pillow. Maybe if I fell back to sleep, the dream would come back. Come on, let's go. Hugo, I was having the best dream. Shh, you will wake up, woo. Every part of me wanted to stay in the bunk bed. My sleeping bag felt warm against the evening chill, and I slid lower into it, hoping Fernando would go away. I had promised to go with him on a midnight mission to sneak into the girls' division. I was supposed to have stayed awake until everyone else dropped off to sleep. But I had dozed off too. Fernando shook my shoulder. <clears throat> Come on, Rodney. Allison actually said I wasn't man enough to visit her in the night. Fernando not man enough. Can you imagine? Well, you are only 12, I responded groggily. Just the idea makes my skin crawl. Wild horses couldn't stop me now, but I need backup. And besides, I'm not going to let you move around here for the next few days thinking about Tabitha, Vamanos, Tabitha. Hearing her name sent two emotions racing through me. One was anger. I was mad at the way she had acted on the soccer field. She sure looked good walking with the grapes. And even though she was in a different cabin than Allison, maybe we'd see her tonight. I sat up and pulled my legs over the side of the bed. I was already dressed in my darkest clothes. I put on my sneakers and started to walk with Fernando out the cabin door. Where are you going? Fernando and I jumped. Josh was looking down at us from his bunk. To the bathroom, I whispered. Go back to sleep. We were fully clothed in black outfits. Fernando had a bandana tied around his head. Josh's face scrunched up and his brain seemed to be struggling with something. Oh, uh, not so loud, I whispered. Oh, uh, Fernando spoke up. Josh, if you must know, we're sneaking into the girls' division. I like girls, he announced. Fernando's eyes flashed in the dark. Rodney, you hear his enthusiasm? You could learn a thing or two from this one. I looked over at Josh. Apart from punching walls and setting bugs on fire, I wondered what enlightening things he could share with me. Would you like to come with us? Fernando asked him. Pretty one's going to be there. I love this guy. We must be brothers. Climb down here and let's go. And with that, the three of us headed off into the night. Winding our way between the dark cabins, I whispered, There's the Algonquin cabin. We can't make any noise. While Fernando and I made our way past the cabins like two ninjas, Josh stomped like a rhino, cracked sticks, and kicked up crinkly dry leaves. Fernando gave me a strained look. Hey, he's your brother, I reminded him. He opened his mouth to reply. But it was Magnus who spoke next. Is somebody out there? He shouted. For a second, we froze in our tracks. Then in a high, scratchy voice, I answered, Just go treat it, Alice! A light went on in the cabin, and we heard the screen door swing open. The three of us burst out laughing and broke into a run toward the woods. Who's back here? Magnus demanded. But it was too late. We were now tearing along scalped Indian path. Hey, Rodney, you do a pretty good girl's voice, Fernando teased. <laughs> you think? I laughed. We slowed down a bit as we entered the woods. We had chosen this path earlier in the day while plotting the adventure, but at night it was a bit creepy. The trail ended at the soccer field, and from there it was just a stroll across the grass to the girls' cabins. We moved on through the dark woods without talking. In the past, this would have been the point where my legs started shaking. But I knew the scariest thing in the woods tonight was the big goon grunting behind me. Actually, 
I was happy to have Josh along. The thought made me smile. Just a few weeks ago, he'd have been the last guy on the planet I would have chosen to be alone with in the pitch black woods. Fernando interrupted my thoughts. Listen, it's nights like this that you'll remember for the rest of your life. I smiled. Sometimes he sounded like he was 12 going on 60. Take a moment to soak it in. Smell the night air. I inhaled deeply through my nose. There was a strong scent of pine needles and then a stronger scent of, oh, gross. <laughs> like that, Rodney? Josh grinned, just like my favorite song. Beans, beans, good for the ear. The more you eat them, the more you stink. The more you stink, the more you drink. The more you drink, the more you pee. So eat all them beans. Interesting version, I commented, holding my nose. Seeing the trees thinning up ahead, I added, there's the field. We walked up to the edge of the forest. The soccer field looked different in the dark. One nice difference was that Mr. Cramps wasn't there yelling at us with his crazy hair flying around. But the change went beyond that. Everything was really still. The goalposts stood out in the darkness, and the white lines on the grass looked like they were floating in space. On the other side of the field, a big orange moon hung just above the tops of the trees. It was a beautiful summer night. And now that a fresh breeze was blowing and Josh was safely behind me on the trail, I took a chance and breathed it all in. As if reading my mind, Fernando said, this place is pretty cool. Then remembering why we were there, he added, just think boys, our destiny awaits us on the other side of this field. We walked on silently and were halfway across when a massive beam from a flashlight blazed in our direction. Down, I hissed. We dropped and lay flat. I could see the beam moving across the grass. It slid over our heads. Madness, I thought. I should have known the big evil jerk would come after us. What was his problem? The light made it to the end of the field and doubled back. Lying still, we waited. The beam lit up our patch of ground, and I prayed our black clothes would blend in with the grass. I watched it reach the other end of the rectangular field and click off. After a couple of tense minutes, we moved forward, crouching on the balls of our feet, ready to drop at a moment's notice. And that's when it hit me. The real reason I didn't want to get caught, I was afraid they would kick me out of camp. Had I suddenly gone crazy? For days, all I wanted to do was leave here. But this midnight mission had somehow changed all that. Despite Todd and Magnus, I was beginning to enjoy Camp Wyme. In fact, I was having the time of my life. As we continued on, however, a feeling of regret began to worm its way to the back of my head. If only I hadn't sent that letter to my parents. Chapter 12, The Girl No One Expected. When we reached the girls' division, the cabins were eerily silent. The only sign of life was in the distance, some moths circling a light bulb outside the girls' bathroom. But by us, it was dark, and every cabin looked the same. Which one? I whispered. Don't worry. When it comes to the ladies, Fernando always finds his way. He held his finger up in the breeze. That one. Let's go. We snuck our way from cabin shadow to rock to bush to tree and eventually arrived at the door of Allison's cabin. Fernando winked. The journey will all have been worth it in a second. He slowly pulled the screen door open, and we stepped into the lavender-scented dark. I heard the breathing of a dozen sleeping girls as my brain digested the enormity of entering such an unfamiliar magical place. I got a little dizzy and almost toppled to the floor. Fernando grabbed my arm. Steady, big fella he whispered. A voice floated to us from the top bunk on the left. I never thought you would actually show. Even in the dark, I could see Allison's red hair hanging down. Fernando's white smile gleamed with satisfaction. It is always a mistake to underestimate Fernando. Allison whispered, I should have known better, and quietly swung down from her bunk. Girls, wake up. We have visitors. Shapes shifted in the dark. My pulse quickened as girls stirred and climbed from their beds. 
Several flashlights clicked on, and one went right into my eyes and stayed there. I felt like a prisoner about to be interrogated. He's cute, some girl giggled. I could live with this kind of interrogation. And check out the muscles on that one, another girl added. Look at these three, our knights in shining armor. Fernando raised a pleased eyebrow in my direction. <clears throat> one girl went up to Josh. What's your name? Josh. You look very strong. You want me to break something? Charming, too, she said in a giggle to her friend. Fernando pulled out a bottle of Coke he had been hiding. Ladies, I've been saving this bottle of bubbly for an occasion like this. He turned the cap. The soda instantly foamed up and blasted out in all directions. How romantic, Allison smirked, wiping the drink from her forehead. Then to me, she added, Rodney, I'm surprised you're not poking around in Tabitha's cabin. Now, that thought had certainly occurred to me, but I've been around Fernando long enough to know how to play it. Who? I asked. Allison rolled her eyes. <laughs> Suddenly, the screen door opened. I could see Mrs. Periwinkle and a counselor or two about to enter. Fernando gave a quick bow. Ladies, another time. He climbed across Allison's bed lifted the window screen and slid out into the night. Josh scrambled after him, showing some rare alertness. I was too far from the opening and realized I wouldn't make it. I weaseled my way into a small alcove between two bunk beds, just as Mrs. Periwinkle entered the room. From my hiding spot, I could see her standing with a large flashlight. A strangely familiar sense of dread crept down my spine. What is going on in here? she demanded. The girls, who had jumped back into bed, pretended to wake up. It would be a miracle if she didn't spot me. I squirmed into the smallest space I could find. I repeat, what is going on in here? Allison spoke up. Mrs. Periwinkle, what do you mean? We were asleep. I held my breath and watched. Mrs. Periwinkle's curly hair cast an eerie glow as she blasted the beam at Allison. Young lady, I had a report that some boys were on the prowl. I'm checking all the cabins. She paused, then added, I guess I was mistaken. Hold on, what is that all over the floor? It was the coke. She squatted down, looking just like a detective at the crime scene. She touched the soda and applied a drop to the end of her tongue. Her eyes hardened and she spat, I taste misbehaving. Then she slowly began moving her flashlight along the walls of the room. I knew it was only a matter of seconds before it reached my hiding spot. Here, Allison whispered, tossing me what looked like a dead rat. It's a wig from last year's show. Mrs. Periwinkle's light was almost upon me now. I stuck the thing on my head and threw a blanket over my shoulders. Who is that? The flashlight was now pointed right at me. I was caught. I was doomed. Who are you? Mrs. Periwinkle demanded. What are you doing over there? No one spoke. You could hear a pine needle drop. Me? I finally answered, putting on a high-pitched girl's voice. I'm Allison's cousin. I had suddenly remembered Fernando teasing me about imitating Gertrude and Alice. I figured I had nothing to lose. You remember me, Mrs. Periwinkle, don't you? She looked confused and annoyed. What's your name again? Rod, Rodwina. Rodwina what? Rawsmith? Rodwina? Rawsmith? She seemed to ponder this. Interesting name! Her eyes were squinting, and I knew the charade was almost up. I prayed the ratwig thing didn't fall off my head. Yes! I continued. A most peculiar name from my mother's side. Anyway, thank you for trying to capture the boys. I can't imagine anything worse than some smelly boys snooping about. Mrs. Periwinkle seemed to soften. Yes, I agree. 
And those particular boys I'm after are most undesirable. Oh, I'm sure they must be, I continued. Anyone who would turn down a good night's rest to violate camp rules must be on a sure path to delinquency. I was on a roll now. I sincerely hope you capture them and punish them severely. Maybe I'd gone a bit too far. Mrs. Periwinkle was looking at me intently, and I gulped quietly. Well, Rodwina, she announced, it is an absolute pleasure meeting you again. It's gratifying to see a proper young lady with a good head on her shoulders, and so pretty. I wish more of these girls had your sensibilities. Good night. Just then the door screeched open. Mrs. Periwinkle, we just found these two snooping about. A counselor brought in Fernando and Josh. The Periwinkle sneer was back. So, you thought you could sneak into the girls' division? Well, as you can see, breaking the rules is not a wise thing to do. You're looking at significant punishment. What do you have to say for yourselves? Before they could answer, I asked in my high voice, Are these the two ruffians? Fernando and Josh noticed me for the first time, and I thought Fernando's eyes were going to pop out of his head. He bit his lip to keep from laughing, but in an instant recovered his usual nonchalant cool. Josh, on the other hand, studied me closely, slowly tilting his head from side to side like a confused dog. I gulped. He was about to blow my cover. He opened his mouth and I cringed. Stop staring at Rodwina, you! Mrs. Periwinkle scolded. You're in enough hot water without upsetting the poor girl! Fernando strode forward and grabbed Mrs. Periwinkle's hand. Pardon me, madame. She tried to shake off his grip, but he held tight and said, I'm very sorry to break the rules, but ever since the first time I saw you atop your beautiful horse, I haven't been able to get you out of my mind. Now it was my turn to keep from laughing as Fernando inched closer to her. I noticed Mrs. Periwinkle had stopped shaking her arm. Hagatha, may I call you that? Such a beautiful name deserves to be said aloud. I expected Mrs. Periwinkle to slap him, but she was still looking mesmerized. Fernando went on. When I looked out at the beautiful moon in the night sky tonight, it made me think of you. And it was all too much for me. He took her hand and placed her palm against his chest. It drove me mad. Mad, I say. I knew I had to see you. It was hard to tell in the dark, but Mrs. Periwinkle seemed to flush. Punish me if you must. Fernando went on. It was worth it. Being here with you now is worth any sacrifice. Mrs. Periwinkle swayed on her feet, and one of the counselors studied her. Shakily, she said, y Yes. Well, Fernando, of course, Fernando, why don't we speak tomorrow and we'll discuss the, er, uh, punishment? Something told me he wasn't going to be scraping zebra mussels off of her boat. Fernando hadn't finished. Oh, and just so you know, the only reason Josh was out tonight was because he was trying to stop me. But stopping this feeling is like trying to stop a locomotive. At this point, the attention turned to Josh. His gaze was still fixed on me, and his dopey look seemed more forced than usual. I cringed. He was going to give me away for sure. What he said next, however, was just as bad. Uh, hi. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm Josh. He took a step in my direction. I saw that he was blushing. <laughs> You sure are pretty. Could we uh get married or something? And that's the end of the chapter.